Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash on October 26th, 2018 for This Week in Prophecy. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. And as usual, prophetic events globally continue to unfold before us, portending the return of Jesus. No, we don't speculate about dates. No, we are not sensationalists or alarmists, but a prayerful and comprehensive and studious view of world events in light of a prayerful and studious contemplation of what the Word of God teaches point to the fact that we are indeed coming to that point in history that the ancient church longed to see. It may be in our lifetime, but certainly things are rapidly taking shape. This time is different than the other times in history when believers thought it was the last days. And as we've said before, there have been multiple such times when believers thought it was the last days. Believing that such figures as Napoleon and Benito Mussolini were the Antichrist. Thinking in the early church, the events of 70 AD portended the return of Jesus. Now they thought these things with good reasons. As we deal with in our book, Shadows of the Beast, there are historical as well as scriptural types of the Antichrist, and certainly Mussolini and Napoleon will be among them. There have been constellations of world events before, certainly in the first and second century, that would easily be interpreted as the last days. What makes this time different? First and foremostly, it is the reality of Israel and the Jews. Never before have the Jews been regathered to their ancient land and their ancient capital at no other time since the early church. Additionally, we are seeing Jews come to faith in Jesus again in significant numbers, the first time since the early centuries of the church. And this happening at a time of growing anti-Semitism, particularly in Europe. This time is different. Yes, we see an apostasy in the church that is staggering, but there have been other times when there's been apostasy. We see a constellation of economic forces rattling the world's cage financially, but this is not the first time that that has happened. Even numbering people. Precedents were sent in such things as the Doomsday Book and the imperial censuses of the Roman governors. This time is different. Israel is reborn as a nation. As so often happens, the mainstream media either fails to report the most important news or underreports it or distorts it or some combination of the above. We try to look at a comprehensive view of what's really transpiring and what it means in light of the teachings of God's word concerning the last days. We don't claim to be the only voice. We don't claim to be a prophetic voice. But we do point people to the voice of the Holy Spirit, urging you to pray, to read the scriptures, and seek the Lord for your own self. And so we come to this week in prophecy, October 26th, 2018. Much of the media globally is captivated by the fact that for every action there will be an equal and opposite reaction in the bombing attempts in the United States against Barack Obama, Bill and Hillary Clinton, and the most latest target, a pipe bomb planted in New York City in a restaurant owned by Robert De Niro, an extreme critic of President Trump and his administration. The left-wing media is, in fact, bordering on blaming the Trump administration for these events, ignoring again for every action there will be an equal and opposite reaction. President Trump has said that no effort will be spared in identifying the person perpetrating these criminal acts. The difference between Antifa and the violence stirred up by the left 
is that this is a lone wolf. It is not an organized effort. Stirred up by Congresswoman Maxine Waters, urging people to harass Republican or conservative members of the Congress or Trump administration in public forums like restaurants and petrol garages, gas stations, and so forth. Or Hillary Clinton, saying that Democrats should not have to behave in a civilized manner in dealing with the Trump administration. This in the aftermath of an attempted assassination and the shooting of a U.S. congressman on a softball field in Virginia in the Washington suburbs. Yet the Democratic Party's response, as it moves increasingly to the left, is to urge more, more, potentially violent confrontation. But there has been a reaction, not an organized one, not one urged by President Trump or any conservative member of Congress, but rather a lone wolf in these attempted actions. We certainly do not condone them, but we certainly do take notice of the fact that they are a reaction to the climate of violence initiated by the left wing of the Democratic Party, which is not only in the ascendancy, but is in virtual control of it at the present time. Let us continue looking at this week in prophecy. The Khashoggi affair continues, but it has completely transformed in its shape and metamorphosized into another kind of event. There has obviously been some effort by Turkey to change the perception of the events in the public eye, particularly internally and domestically within Turkey. There has also been the efforts of the Saudi Arabian and American governments <coughs> to put a perspective on the Khashoggi assassination that would be less indicting of the Saudi government and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Let's understand again the reasons why. Concerning Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, Recep Erdogan, who is a Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood of Turkey, he's a radical Islamist, he's no friend of Israel, no friend of the West, and he doesn't like the Saudis and they don't like him for reasons we've addressed last week in Prophecy gave his promised speech, but did not bring any new evidence against Saudi Arabia, pointing to the fact that the Saudis have arrested 18 people, attempting to portray it as a rogue operation, something that was carried out by officials of the Saudi government, but not with their direct participation in terms of the crown prince or the king or the senior leadership. Now remember, concerning Mr. Erdogan, he has a major problem. He needs the cooperation of Saudi Arabia, despite his hatred for them, because of petrodollars and oil production and the viability of its economy at a time when the Turkish lira is collapsing. He also needs the help of the United States with its influence in international institutions such as the IMF, World Bank, etc. when the lira is crashing. A complete devaluation of the lira has already to a degree taken place, complete in the sense that it does not have even half the buying power that it did when it was first launched after inflation became so high in Turkey that it cost 175,000 lira to buy a bottle of water. They eliminated the zeros, but now they're back almost to where they began. Things are getting out of control and they're heading the wrong direction quickly. It is unthinkable that without the help of the United States and of Saudi Arabia, 
that Turkey can control this devaluation of the lira or its ramifications. Mr. Erdogan's motives are most assuredly not political or goodwill, but they are an act of political desperation. It has been alleged that the Trump administration is following the same line in placating the Saudis as have the previous Clinton and Bush administrations for the sake of arms contract, for the sake of international oil prices, etc. This it will always be a factor in American-Saudi relations, but it has not been the overriding factor. The Trump administration has made it clear that it will look upon an assassination of Khashoggi as a criminal act that had the active participation of the Saudi government, and there will be ramifications despite the present climate. The Saudis, however, know that as they're transitioning into a leadership from the present king into Mohammed bin Salman, in the face of the Iranian threat and in the face of the Saudi need to reinvent its own economy from something that is a welfare state completely oil dependent, that it cannot afford to alienate the United States any more than it already has. This is not a new Saudi approach. In the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, the Saudi Arabian government, which is essentially the House of Saud, it's an extended family, is the government, was in a situation where members of the government and of the House of Saud were involved with Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. The Saudis reacted quickly. Three people believed to have been funding, in fact, virtually proven to have been funding, Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia either disappeared, died, or were mysteriously killed. There was a crackdown immediately under American pressure, and the Saudis found what some would describe as scapegoats, others as actual perpetrators of a renegade policy not sanctioned by the king. The American public has been kept from knowing part of the realities of this from the 28 pages that remain censored from the 9-11 report. Nonetheless, the game the Saudis are playing and the approach they're taking to the Khashoggi affair is a familiar one. And the role the United States is playing is a familiar one. The United States has no particular love for what Mr. Khashoggi was. We've reported this. Although he is being eulogized by the left-wing media, he was a supporter and a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's his background. An opponent of Israel, a false moderate. If someone is Muslim Brotherhood, they are not a moderate. And so we move to this week in prophecy. To the UK, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn pressing to become the next Prime Minister to displace essentially the failed leadership of Theresa May, who's failed in everything from foreign policy to Brexit negotiations, kept alive only by the goodwill of Northern Irish parliamentarians. Mr. Corbyn has announced this week in prophecy that Hamas, which is the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza, that are perpetrating these terrorist attacks that are setting these forest fires with incendiary balloons that are repressing their own people, carrying out assassinations of rival political parties within Gaza, including the Palestinian Authority. They've been involved in every sort 
of human rights violation imaginable, not only against the Israelis, but against their own people. Yet Mr. Corbyn is stating that if he was to become prime minister, policy towards Hamas would change. Hamas can no longer be considered to be a terrorist organization. This flies not simply in the face of Israel, but in the face of the United States and various other European and NATO powers. Mr. Corbyn is indeed a dangerous figure politically. He will be dangerous for the policies of the United States. He will be dangerous for Israel, but he will be particularly dangerous for Great Britain. This is transpiring this week in prophecy. The Saudis have admitted that the assassination of Khashoggi was premeditated. They've carried on what some people think is a charade of a joint investigation with the Turkish authorities. But both the Saudis and the Turks are lending a lot of credence to it because they both have political motives for doing so. And in the case of Turkey, economic motives. The Americans want the situation defused, not simply or primarily for the sake of the arms deal, but because of the ramifications in jointly facing the threat from Iran, and because the Trump administration has never trusted Mr. Khashoggi to begin with, his Muslim brotherhood in his background. Now, he's of course been assassinated. The left, as usual, are ignoring the facts. We bring you the actual facts of what's really happening. May the Lord continue to guide us to do so. We're not claiming some divine revelation or super spiritual insight that illuminates these things to us beyond the capacity of ordinary intelligent people without any reference to their faith. But we do pray when we consider these events in the Middle East. And we do believe the Lord is a God who gives wisdom to his people to understand these events. Jesus told us, when we see these things unfolding in the Olivet Discourse, faithful believers will know what's going on. Faithful believers will know what they mean. This will exactly recapitulate the state that the believers were in, in the events leading up to 70 AD. The church in Israel and in Jerusalem, under the leadership of Simeon, a cousin of Jesus who succeeded James, was a brother who knew what was happening. Together with the other leaders, they gave understanding to the people as to what was happening. And before the final acts fell, they were rescued from the destruction of Jerusalem when Titus inexplicably withdrew temporarily lifting the siege, allowing the believers to escape to the hills of Judah in response to the instructions of Jesus. This, as we've talked about in our book, Carpezo, is a type, a shadow of the rapture. And it refers to those in Daniel 11 who have insight and who will give understanding to the people, to the many, to the saints, to the believers. It happened in 70 AD, and it will happen again. Now, as in 70 AD, we have to remember something. The lament of the author of the Hebrews was that, as Jewish believers, and as veteran believers who were not newly saved, at least most of them, were not babes in Christ. You should be teachers by now in Hebrews chapter 5, and they again required milk. 
This was before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. They had become slack in their understanding of God's word, despite the fact that they had so many advantages. Nonetheless, they must have heeded the rebuke, the admonishment, and taking the corrective instruction. The believers were rescued. Things were galvanized. May it so happen again in these last days. We have to give Christians milk because they don't know basic doctrine anymore. At a time, they desperately need to be eating meat. But the faithful remnant will galvanize in response to the conviction and empowering of the Holy Spirit. They will resort to the Word of God radically. Those who have understanding will give insight to the many. The good and faithful servant will give the proper food at the proper time. By the way, I do not claim to be the good and faithful servant. I simply appeal to what the text is saying and what Jesus predicted. We must always go back historically to understand prophecy. As we have reiterated multiple times, after prayer, the first essential requirement in understanding the future is understanding the past. One cannot grasp the realities of prophecy for the future unless they understand history and how prophecy was fulfilled in the past. And so we see it taking place once more this week in prophecy. Let us move on to a lot of the real news that is not being popularly reported by the mainstream media. On the 19th of October, only 10,000, now that seems like a large riot, but it's nothing like the numbers that Hamas was gathering, assembled at the Israeli-Gaza border, hurling 33 incendiary devices. This was not a huge turnout. There were nine balloon incendiary attacks carried out this week in prophecy by Hamas or Islamic Jihad. And the Israelis responded with eight airstrikes. What has happened now that Hamas is not able to turn out the humongous numbers of people to riot at the border they once did, making border incursions? This week in prophecy, they fired two tornadoed G missiles at Tel Aviv and at Beersheba. One failed to reach its target crashing into the sea, another hit a house. They did not do the damage they were programmed to do, possibly testifying to the inefficiency of Hamas and operating advanced guided missile systems. Nonetheless, Hamas has resorted to direct missile attacks. It's been forced to do so. But something else transpiring this week that is underreported <coughs> is the dilemma faced once again by King Abdullah II in Jordan. As we reported last week in prophecy, he has declined to renew the continuation on two annex parcels of land in the Jordan Valley along the Israel-Jordan border that were negotiated by his father, King Hussein. He has done this in order to please radical Islamic elements within his own country and to boost his rapprochement with Qatar, greatly disfavored by the Saudis for their friendship with Iran and for being the communications base of fundamentalist radical organizations. 
and also the base of broadcast of Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera. They are not liked by the Saudis and by other moderate Persian Gulf states and the Emirates. Not that the Saudis themselves can be considered moderate, but some of the Emirates are relatively moderate. In comparison, of course, to Saudi Arabia and Iran, places like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, even to a degree Kuwait are much more moderate. But these are out of favor with the regime in Qatar, who tries to play both sides. King Abdullah of Jordan has made this reproshma towards not only Qatar, but towards Syria and towards the Muslim Brotherhood led regime of Erdogan in Turkey. Why is he doing this? Jordan has a history of betting on the wrong horse. In 1967, King Hussein of Jordan was essentially bamboozled by Abdul Gamal Nasser, president of Egypt, an ally of the Soviet Union, into attacking Israel from the east during the 1967 war. Israel thought its conflict was with Egypt and with Syria on the Golan Heights. The Jordanian attack came as almost a surprise attack. It resulted in Jordan losing strategic control of the West Bank, which it no longer even wants. Nonetheless, the Jordanians miscalculated. Despite being friendly to America and Britain, despite having a history of earlier attempts at peace with Israel, for which King Abdullah I was assassinated in Jerusalem in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as we've addressed last week in Prophecy, Jordan entered the fray to its detriment. In 1991, King Hussein again miscalculated, throwing in his lot with Saddam Hussein. Not that he liked or supported Saddam Hussein, but he opposed the American-led Gulf War desert storm to liberate Kuwait and to attack Iraq in the process, as was a strategic necessity in order to liberate Kuwait. This made him no friends with the Kuwaitis, with the Gulf states, or with the Saudi Arabians. It blew up in his face. The environmental disaster he predicted did in fact transpire. He was correct in some of what he said, but it has hurt Jordan politically and economically even to this day. Not only that, his efforts to assuage the regime of the late Saddam Hussein were in order to placate his own Palestinian population, which is 70% of Jordan. He himself, being a Hashemite Bedouin, his family and roots are from Saudi Arabia, only represent 30% of Jordan demographically. Remember, the reality is, because of the way the British divided the Middle East in the aftermath of the First World War, he is a Hashemite king of a Palestinian Arab country. Yasser Arafat acknowledged this. The Jordanian government acknowledged this. He lives in the shadow, as did his father, of Black September, when Arafat attempted to take control of Jordan and was slaughtered by the Hashemite Kingdom's British-trained and equipped military. Once more, he's facing a problem. 
Hamas in Gaza and the Muslim Brotherhood are attempting, attempting to launch terrorist attacks on Israel from Jordan in the east in some kind of coordinated attack with what happens in Gaza. He needs to find a way to prevent this from happening. He does not want to see a military conflict that would involve Israel attacking Hamas targets inside of Jordan. At the present, he is trying to move into a direction that would seem to appease, to a degree, Hamas-leaning and Muslim Brotherhood-leaning interests inside of the Hashemite kingdom. He's in a very difficult situation. Now, of course, we understand what he states publicly and what he thinks privately, or tells the Americans and Israelis privately, may be two very different things. We don't know for sure. We only know what is publicly visible for sure. But we do know that these things are happening inside Jordan this week in prophecy, and they have a prophetic significance. Let us move on. The most important strategic news or news of a military implication this week in prophecy is again one that is not being discussed by the Pentagon, by the State Department, by the White House. It's certainly not being widely discussed, commented on, or even reported in the media. That is, the Trump administration has been acting covertly with the Israelis to counter the now deployed presence of Russian S-300 anti-aircraft missile batteries in Syria. This week in Prophecy, it was disclosed that American and Israeli intelligence have become aware that Russia has manned these batteries with Iranians trained by the Russians in Iran and possibly inside Russia. Russia actually flew them into Syria. Why is this? Why are the Russians using Iranians to operate these batteries? We have to remember that Iran has the same weapons system in order to counter the threat of Israeli or American airstrikes against targets in Iran where nuclear technology is involved in Iran's efforts to manufacture atomic weapons of mass destruction. The entire affair going back now to Mr. Trump's dealing with the reality in the face of the fabrications that were perpetrated by the Obama administration, by John Kerry, and by Hillary Clinton. Iran has a nuclear objective, and the arrangements entered into by the previous administration did nothing of substance to prevent it. In fact, it allowed it to continue under auspicious means. Already having Russian-trained Iranian anti-aircraft missile crews operating the S-300 and the advanced radar systems required to detect the targets and to guide the missiles to the targets. Um, a new picture has come into play. You have Russia, 
using Russian military advisors and Russian technology, Russian weapons, Iranian missile crews, and Syrian bases inside Syria, all fixed on countering, threatening Israel's ability to respond to aggression from Syria. This, again, has been coming to a head for some time. It takes place at a time when the United States is actively engaged in cooperation with Kurdish forces in eastern Syria, in which hundreds of Russians have already been killed, they being mercenaries along the banks of the Euphrates, slaughtered by American Marines and American-advised Kurds. A great embarrassment to the Putin regime, who tries to portray a tough guy image. Bearing in mind, he needs to play this nationalist card due to the serious economic situation he faces inside Russia. Russia being an oil export driven economy and natural gas economy. It really does not have any other major exports other than weapons. He must play his tough guy image and it's not working. Neither did it work when the reconnaissance plane killing 19 Russian Air Force personnel was downed by a Syrian for which he blames Israel, aerial and electronic maneuvers. Hence the deployment of the S-300, specifically the PMU-2 version, which is an advanced version, again, operated by Iranians. On the 25th of October, this week in prophecy, the Kremlin, announced its concerns when Dmitry Peskov, the senior spokesman for the Putin regime in the Kremlin, said that it believed the United States Navy's Poseidon 8 aircraft, a reconnaissance aircraft with some of the most advanced electronic warfare hardware available and counter electronic warfare apparatus available, that is, airborne, was responsible for the control of as much as 300 unarmed aerial vehicles attacking the Russian-Syrian airbase at Kmimim, at Kmimim, where there is a S-300 deployment. What Mr. Putin obviously fears concerning these American British assisted reconnaissance operations carried out by the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy is the United States is looking for holes in the S 300's anti aircraft system in the detection capacity that accompanies the S 300's and in the guidance capacity, controlling the S-300s to hit their targets. Last week in Prophecy, we spoke of how the Israelis are relying more on the older F-15 than they are the F-35, at least that was the official report using a version of the F-15 that is updated and modified called the Secret Eagle, the SE, due to potential deficiencies in the F-35, although the F-35 is a stealth aircraft, while the F-15 is not. Some of the detection capacity and the evasive capacity of the F-15 to avoid detection is functionally superior in aerial combat operations to the F-35 by the reckoning of some <coughs> American and Israeli area warfare experts. This week in prophecy, however, 
something else has transpired. The Trump administration has sent Israel active squadrons of American F-35s that were deployed in the Gulf. They've increased the number of F-35s. We have to remember that the F-35 flown by Israeli pilots penetrated already Iranian airspace two months ago where the same weapons and guidance systems controlling the S-300 and S-400 are operational. A precedent was already set in evasion. A factor may have been, but we do not know, obviously neither the Israelis or Americans are talking, but Israel may have mounted some of its own electronic countermeasures onto the fuselage of the F-35 who penetrated the Iranian airspace. What is known this week in prophecy is that the Americans have provided more to the Israelis. How many more? How they're being funded under what international agreement is all being kept secret. Russia and Syria, together with Iran, are now engaged in having to come to terms with the prospect that the Poseidon 8 used to control unarmed drone-type vehicles of an advanced design having in its crosshairs the S-300 batteries and their guidance systems at Russian bases such as Jemim create a very difficult and precarious situation. Russia has made this a diplomatic issue by linking it to the upcoming summit to take place in Paris on the 11th of November between Vladimir Putin and President Donald Trump. Without doubt, the issue was going to be on the table. Because of the successful Israeli penetration with the F-35 and American technical assistance, because of the activities of the Poseidon 8, because of the UAV attacks, and various other reconnaissance efforts that are not being widely reported. Mr. Putin is getting nervous. It would be an embarrassment if the Israelis were to evade these detection systems and successfully take out the S-300s. There has not been an Israeli air attack in five weeks on Syria. But there have been UAV attacks and reconnaissance efforts by both Israel and the United States and even Great Britain along the coast of Lebanon, Syria, Galilee, and along the border area between Syria and Jordan, obviously involving the cooperation of the Jordanian government. Again, not publicly spoken of, but not secret from the powers that be. The Kremlin knows exactly what is going on. Large sectors of the Israeli public certainly know what's going on. Those in the know in the United States know what's going on. But it's still not popularly, popularly addressed in the media. We can understand the reasons the State Department and the Pentagon want to play it down. But it does show us that what is reported and discussed has an underreported parallel in matters that are as important, if not more important, than the front page headlines. The danger here is, instead of taking a cautious and intelligent analysis, of these realities, and prayerfully looking at them in light of whatever biblical prophetic texts may apply, conspiracy theorists get a hold of it. 
including conspiracy theorists within the church who think they are dealing with end-time prophecy and discernment, but they're essentially conspiracy theorists. As we always say, one of the problems of dealing with conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists is there's always a measure of truth in what they say. It is what they embellish, extrapolating conjecture that becomes the problem. Nonetheless, we're faced with this reality. The Americans have increased the numbers of F-35s going to Israel. We know that the fuselage of the F-35 has become a platform for the addition of Israeli avionic innovations that has successfully, with American assistance, already penetrated Iranian airspace where the same missile systems are deployed as well as the detection and guidance systems, the most sensitive radars are deployed. UAV activity and the Poseidon 8 American reconnaissance activity all show that the United States and Israel are taking countermeasures concerning this upgraded deployment of the S-300 that Mr. Putin rushed to following the downing of the Russian reconnaissance plane killing 19 Russian servicemen. The memory in the Kremlin is of 1987, where prior to a summit with the Reagan government, America and Israel did not heed Soviet warnings at that time concerning aerial warfare with Syria. The Israelis pushed ahead with American backing and the Syrian Air Force was really manned by Russian Soviet pilots and not for the first time. These Russian manufactured MiG aircraft flown by Russian pilots with Syrian insignia on them, as if they were Syrian Air Force, but functionally Soviet Air Force, were slaughtered by the Israeli Air Force, partially due to the Hawkeye EC-90 American airborne radar and reconnaissance aircraft that the United States had provided to Israel. Mr. Putin does not want another scenario like that. Having already lost 19, shot down by the Syrians, he does not want to see anything like this happen again. Hence, he is using Iranians, because if the Israelis take these targets out and destroy these S-300 batteries, the victims will not be Russian, or the uh, combatants killed will not be Russian. They will be Iranian. It is a political safeguard for himself. He knows what will happen. More Russians will die in addition to the hundreds already killed by the Americans and others killed by the Syrians in an accident that he blames on Israel. Very, very precarious situation indeed. Very precarious. Russia is getting very nervous. The Israelis have not struck in five weeks. The S-300 are deployed, as are the advanced radar systems necessary for the detection of Israeli aircraft and the guidance of the missile systems. Not all has been at a premium, however. The two missiles fired from Gaza at Tel Aviv and at Beersheba were going back now to the Tornado Guard missiles. Neither one were intercepted by the Israeli Iron Dome. The Iron Dome is very good. But like the American Patriot missile system, 
or like the Arrow missile system. It is not invincible by any means. The most advanced avionics countermeasure system in terms of surveillance and counter-surveillance technology ever deployed at sea, the American Aegis system, mounted on American cruisers and destroyers, have been penetrated by American aircraft in secret maneuvers when the United States operated against itself in training exercises, attempting to use Russian-style air tactics to see if the Russians would have the capacity to also penetrate the Aegis system. None of these systems are absolutely invincible. Not the American Aegis, as good and brilliant as it is. Not the Iron Dome, as good as it has largely proven to be. But certainly not the radar systems for the Russian S-300 either. Iran knows this. Syria knows this. And Vladimir Putin certainly knows this. And he knows it this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you for listening. We urge prayer for the American elections coming up very, very shortly. We would urge all Christians to vote and to pray for the best outcome. Moriel is not a political organization or a vehicle to campaign politically for any party. But we do take a stand on moral issues such as abortion, same-sex marriage. We do take a stand on the support for Israel. Therefore, we urge prayer for President Trump and his administration. Without reference to Moriel, I don't think that Mr. Trump is perfect. He has certain policies I am not in agreement with or are only partially in agreement with, that I'm only partially able to sanction. But the clear majority of what he's done has been to the advantage of the body of Christ and to Israel, and I believe corporately to America and the West generally. Please, please pray that the proponents of abortion, the proponents of same-sex marriage, the proponents of befriending terrorist organizations like Hamas do not get the victories they seek. It is the Lord who establishes leaders and removes them, Daniel chapter 2 tells us. Please may God give us grace. Please may he sustain a godly leadership in the United States. Again, I am not making a political endorsement of Donald Trump or of any party or of any candidate. It's not within our mandate to do that. But it is our mandate to pray for those in government and to stand on biblical principles. The Lord will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. There is much of what President Trump is saying concerning the Federal Reserve System I agree with. There's much he says concerning illegal immigration that depresses wages in the Afro-American and Hispanic American working communities. There's much I agree with. There are things I don't agree with. But he is the leader. We need to pray for him. And we need to pray that those who oppose scriptural moral values and who are opposed to Israel and God's prophetic plan and destiny for Israel and the Jews will not gain an assent. We are reminded that Barack Obama's final act in international relations as president 
was to lobby foreign nations such as New Zealand and Great Britain to vote against Israel in the UN, in the UNESCO vote, to strip Israel of any historic claim to the Wiley Wall, to the Kotel, to biblical sites that the Word of God plainly says are Israelite. That was the last thing he did. And while 83% of Republicans, and I'm not a Republican, 83% of Republican voters are sympathetic to Israel, only 21% of Democrats are. It is something similar in Great Britain. Conservatives are sympathetic to Israel. Mr. Corbyn, the shadow prime minister, leader of the Labour Party, is not simply no friend of Israel. Looking at some of what he's said and done, one would be hard-pressed, in the opinion of many people, to say he's not an anti-Semite. Again, you see in the United States, major figures from the Democratic Party have aligned themselves with Louis Farrakhan, a man who's made racist statements, anti-Semitic statements. What would happen if conservatives or libertarians or republicans align themselves publicly on a platform and a photo op with David Duke or the Ku Klux Klan? Not that there's much left to them anymore, fortunately. But what would happen? What would the media reaction be? But there is no media reaction when left-wing Democrats do the same thing. One of the loudest voices, together with, of course, Senator Richard Durbin, Dick Durbin of Illinois, and Camilla Harris of California, hearings, was New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. Cory Booker admits in the 1990s to a sexual harassment of a homosexual nature. He admits it. And now he's been charged with it again. Where is the media coverage? They were all over Mr. Kavanaugh for something that the alleged victim could not even remember the time, the place, or the year. And all four of the witnesses she cited could lend no credibility to her testimony. But with Cory Booker, it's obvious. He's admitted he's already done it once. Now he's charged again. Nobody's saying anything. Or Keith Ellis, the first Muslim in the U.S. Congress, charged with assault of a woman. Again, why is a woman entitled to be believed in her allegations simply because she's a woman when it came to Mr. Kavanaugh, but not when it is Keith Ellis? I pray that God raises his hand against the hypocritical and corrupt media. I would love to see the Lord raise his hand against CNN, MSNBC, the BBC, and the networks. Not because of ideology, but because of dishonesty, what many would term corruption, and unspeakable, unspeakable hypocrisy. Jeff Zucker at CNN is a man who infuriates me. I can think of no one more idiotic than a left-wing Jew in the present climate. Why don't you sew a yellow star on your own jacket and pay your own train fare to Auschwitz if you're going to align yourself with those who are haters of Israel 
and de facto anti-Semites. Why would you do that? I say this as a person with Jewish, a Jewish family. I love my children very much, my grandchild very much. My children are born in Israel. My wife's family survived the Holocaust. How can Jews in America and Britain do this? It makes no logical sense. None. There must be a spiritual blindness associated with it. And it's unbelievable. Finally, this week in prophecy, I'd like to briefly address something that is marginal to our overall focus and thrust. I agreed for the purposes of evangelism to the glory of God alone to appear in a documentary film called The Daniel Project. From this, a great B movie sold to commercial interests called The Daniel Connection was extrapolated as some kind of a sequelized version of the documentary, hiring a top Hollywood actress and secular artists. As a Christian, I was told I was doing it for the glory of God, letting them use footage of myself from the previous Daniel Project. I engaged in those projects with Studio Scotland, which is the same organization as GB247, not for commercial purposes. I did it without any contract, taking any money other than airfares to where I needed to go to, to be in the films. I did it gratis. I did it as under the Lord. I did it because I wanted to do it for evangelism, not for commercial purposes. Those films are about prophecy. They were supposedly produced as evangelistic instruments using prophecy. That's why I agreed to narrate. It was not something I did for commercial purposes. I therefore appeal to Studio Scotland to withdraw the circulation of those films. I do not want my name or image associated with ventures that have become commercial in nature. If it was sold, a film with me and it sold, a great B movie that I refuse to act in, sold the commercial film interest, that was not the purpose why I agreed to it. To ask Christians to do something as a ministry under the Lord, to do it gratis while the non-believers are being paid, and then to sell it. Studio Scotland, GB247, are now promoting open heresy, which they cannot deny is heresy. There was a former member of the Morial team who has made a number of statements that are heretical in nature. In June of this year, he, of course, posted a teaching that we can pray into pieces of fabric and impart the anointing of God into the fabric itself. In addition to his teaching that the blood of Christ is not eternally efficacious, that animal sacrifice will have an atoning power in the millennium, that Rhema's personal words from the Lord to be treated as a co-equal authority with the logos, with the printed word, as it were, many things that are utterly false and even heretical. But now this week in prophecy, 
There are new statements by him in audio format, now in the public domain, where he states that God the Father is not the creator and that Satan has no power. Peter said Satan goes around like a lion looking for someone to devour. He does have power. A fatally wounded animal is its most dangerous before it expires. So too, Satan goes around looking for someone to devour. He is not powerless. And God the Father is the creator. In the early church, we had the line of faith. I'm not appealing to later credos or creeds or church councils, even ones I would in principle agree with, such as the Athanasian Creed or the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> I speak only of the original Apostles' Creed. Copies of the New Testament were being circulated as fast as they could be copied. The number of gospel manuscripts we have, 10,000 fragments, codexes, scrolls, is massive. When we only have 420 of Caesar's conquests, we have 10,000 of the gospels. But there was no printing press. The line of faith was what was circulated. It was a synopsis of the essential teaching of the Apostles, which we call the Apostles' Creed. It opens with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. When we read John 1, when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we see, that the Father created through Jesus. A description of this is found in Proverbs chapter 8. To say that God the Father is not the creator is another heretical lie. Yet Studio Scotland cannot deny these things are lies, cannot defend these false doctrines, so it makes it a ad hominem attack on me personally for standing against it, saying how bad of a person I am and all of these things, things that are not true, in order to divert attention away from the fact that what they are actively promoting is a ministry and a man who is dangerously heretical. Those films were made as evangelistic instruments to reach the unsaved for the glory of God. That is why I did them. That is why I appeared in them and put my best, my prayerful best into them. I wanted to see souls saved and God glorified. Took no payment. I did not do it for commercial reasons. I do not want any, anything using my name, or my image, or our ministry, anything, being commercially distributed or sold to commercial interests by a studio Scotland or a GV24-7 that is actively engaged in the defense and promotion of undeniable heresy. If Stuart Manilaws wants to debate me, if it's heretical to say God the Father is not the creator, I'll debate him. But if he's not willing to debate me and prove me wrong, if he's not willing to defend what he is promulgating, that the blood of Jesus is not eternally efficacious, or that we can pray into a cloth and empower the fabric. If he's not willing to debate me on those issues, it's because he cannot defend them. He knows they are false, and he's promoting them anyway for some interest, be it commercial or otherwise. It's not the interest of God. It is not the reason those films were supposedly produced 
and why I and other Christians did all we could to see those films made and succeed. I publicly, publicly ask that those films or anything else using me, using my face, using my name, where prophecy was employed evangelistically, that I agreed to without any remuneration, be removed. I do not want anything from myself or our ministry being circulated or distributed for commercial purposes by an organization in Scotland that has defended and given avenue to someone actively engaged in the propagation of open heresy. This webcast comes to you from the United States where we have fair use laws, where we have a First Amendment, where we have slap suits for spurious litigation. You cannot use litigation as a legal threat or instrument where you do not have a strong case by American law in light of American constitutional provision of free speech and of right of fair use for recorded materials. If something naming me appears, I have the right to cite it, to show excerpts of it as is required to respond. This is the United States. If somebody wants to hire American lawyers to fight me in the United States, where our Morio TV is incorporated, registered, domained, operated from, web hosted, please do so. I'll see you in court. If you want to violate 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and take a believer to court, the Lord will deal with you. But I'm ready. Heresy is what we're talking about. I do not want to be associated with any organization that promotes heresy. Do you really believe that God the Father is not the creator? Do you really believe the blood of Jesus is not eternally efficacious or you can pray into a pie the power of God? I don't. I don't want to be associated with any ministry that does or any ministry that promotes or defends an agent of such apostate false doctrine. This is related to prophecy. Here at Moriel, our interest in prophecy is to prepare the church for the return of Jesus and to use prophecy to reach the unsaved while there is still time. That is why I agreed to participate in the Daniel Project and the Daniel Factor. I did not want it distributed or sold by an organization that now defends a ministry that has said God the Father is not the creator or the blood of my Messiah is not eternally efficacious or that I can pray the power of God into fabric. I don't want to be distributed by an organization like that. If they want to defend these doctrines, let them defend it. I'll debate them. But if they cannot defend these doctrines, take me out of your catalog and anything with my face, my voice, and my image. I don't want to be associated with you. You propagate things 
that are of the devil. If you propagate a ministry that teaches such things, I word that very carefully. You're supporting a ministry that has taught these things. Even if you try to say you don't agree with them yourselves, then why are you promoting such an organization if you know it's heretical? Otherwise, if you agree with it, then you're a heretic. Debate me in defense of your heresy. And heresy is a strong word. It is not just false doctrine. It is schismatic. Leave the personal attacks out of it. I can respond similarly, but I don't want to go down to your level. Remove those films from your catalog. I don't want to be a part of it. Prophecy is to prepare the people of God, the children of God, the church of Jesus for his return, and to use as a vehicle to present the gospel in these last days. That is why, and the only reason why, I did your films. And I did it without any payment or even desire for payment. But don't tell me I'm doing something for Jesus and then go sell it commercially and pocket the money or whatever you did with it. American laws are very different. Frivolous lawsuits don't work well in America and they're going to cost you a lot of money. You won't win. I'm not afraid because I'm telling the truth. This week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you.